Hello again, Jules fans. Uh, welcome back to another episode of Jules in the Blood TV. I am flying solo today. As you are all probably aware, Rotherham uh, is unfortunately off tomorrow due to the snow and wintry conditions that have engulfed the southeast of England at the moment. Um, so yeah, something slightly different today. Going to have a look back at our season so far, um, how Steve Lovell has turned things around in a little bit more detail, and also a look at those players that are going to be out of contract towards the end of the campaign. Um, I don't want to talk about the start of the campaign too much, to be quite honest. We know that AD Pennock was in charge in the summer, and after what was a rather promising pre-season, um, once the competitive games got started, um, it was horrible. Let's be quite honest, it was um, it was painful to watch. Uh, we didn't score in our first four competitive fixtures of the season. Um, we didn't win for nearly the first two months of the season. Um, yeah, and statistically, it was it was pretty tragic before um, Adrian Pennock was put out of his misery at the end of September. Um, Obviously, Peter Taylor played a small part in that reign as well. So I've done it as a, a combined effort, so to speak. Um, but statistically, it was shocking. It was played 15, won three, drew four, lost eight, scored nine, conceded 18, and had a win percentage of 20% under Adrian Pennock and Peter Taylor during that early part of the season. Um, scored 0.6 goals per game, and we were conceding 1.2 goals per game. Um, it was just... Awful, awful. Scumfort game sticks in my mind when Peter Taylor took over and we didn't play a centre forward, no striker on the pitch. Uh, one of the most painful nil nils I've ever watched. Um, Peter Taylor will probably say, and rightly so, that, he, that he'd come in and steadied the ship. Um, but we then lost to Blackburn and lost to Portsmouth. Um, yeah, and it was just um, a bit of a disaster. By all accounts, it wasn't fun at all. Nobody was looking forward to going to football. Uh, but then, thankfully, um, Peter Taylor left for one reason or another, and this man arrived on his white charger. Played 28, won 12, drawn 10, lost only 6, scored 45, conceded 33, with a goal difference of plus 12. That is... Steve Lovell's uh, overall record since taking charge of the Jills in all competitions, and he has a win percentage of 43%. Um, if you're going to um, look at it just on League One, he has won 10 times in 23 games, still 43%. Um, and if we compare that to the previous two regimes, uh, Justin Edinburgh had a win percentage of 37% in his time at the football club and Adrian Pennock had a win percentage of 17%. Yet that is 17 one, seven. I feel like you have to do that thing on the video printer when a team scores more than six or seven goals. Yeah, it was that bad, Jules fans, we know that. Um, defensively, we're slightly better than we were, conceding 1.17 per game compared to 1.2 under AD and Peter Taylor. So it shows that defensively wasn't massively the issue, even under AD and Peter. It was just the fact that they couldn't get us to score football goals and put things in football nets. Um, but the massive turnaround is offensively. Um, well, obviously we've scored 45 goals in, in 28 games, which is excellent to see. Um, we're consistently in games now. Um, but just back to the defensive side of things, Steve Lovell's kept five clean sheets in charge of us in 28 fixtures. Um, so that's 18% of his games have ended up with a shutout, which is one in five just under, which isn't too bad. So if you're looking at 46 league games in a season in the league, say 45, one every five is nine clean sheets. It's not too bad a return at League One level. That's compared to three in 54 games last season under Justin Edinburgh and then Adrian Pennant, which worked out to 6%. So... Tick, another um, statistic that obviously shows improvement, as I've already touched on consistently more um, in games all the time. We've lost six times under Steve and we've only lost by more than one goal on two occasions. That was at the league leaders a few weeks ago, Wigan Athletic, who will beat plenty of better sides than us by plenty more goals, I'm sure, and they already have done. And the other one was an FA Cup replay up at Carlisle before Christmas when we lost 3-1. Obviously, we were chasing the game at 2-1 down to try and earn ourselves some extra time and potentially penalties. So, understandable in a cup fixture, as disappointing as it was. Um, we lost six times under Adrian Pennock. 
Um, and yeah, there was only one more occasion where we lost more, more than two goals because we lost 2 0 at Reading in the Carabao Cup early on in the campaign, and we lost 3 0 at Oxford and Rochdale. Um, but the big difference is um, competitive loss percentage Adrian Pennock, 55%, Steve Lovell, 21%. It's a huge, huge improvement from Steve and the boys and all the coaching staff. Um, and as I like to say, long may it continue. So yeah, defensively, that's us had a look at. We're very, very sound now. Um, we're in the majority of football matches. We're not getting beaten out of sight by anyone, which has been a, a problem for the last sort of 12, 18 months, probably up to two years if we're looking at it. Um, and then on the other side, offensively, the improvement's been staggering, to be quite um, frank. Um, Steve Lovell said early on in his reign, and a few of the players come out and said about it, that they were enjoying their football more than they had under any other manager, he was allowing them to go and express themselves within the constraints and the confines of a system and a formation and a plan. Something we didn't seem to have for, for far too long of the Adrian Pennant reign and didn't really have, it seemed, at the back end of the Justin Edinburgh reign. So, so that's great to see. 45 goals in 28 games we've scored at 1.6 per game. So if you equated, that's obviously in all competitions, but if you equated that into a 46-game league campaign, that would be 74 league goal score, which would be really good. Um, and yeah, I think one of the big reasons for that is because um, he's formed um, a proper strike partnership for us in the form of Tom Eves and Josh Parker. It's the first one I can recall in years, probably going back to Carlos Saba and Bob Taylor late 1990s. I know the game's changed, granted, we don't you don't tend to see lots of teams playing two up top now. It tends to be 4-2-3-1 or 4-3-3, whichever way you want to look at it, with two wide attackers and a central striker. But we have, under the majority of Steve Lovell's games, we've played two out and out front men, and um, we're reaping the benefits. If we look at the comparisons, Josh Parker under Adrian Pennock scored two in 11 at 0.18 per game this season. And Tom Eaves had four in ten, so it was 0.4, so that's a pretty different, decent return. But you have to remember three of them came in one fixture. Um, Josh Parker, in comparison, under Steve Lovell, has nine in 27, so it's up from 0.18 to 0.33 per game, which is really good. And Tom Eaves, ten in 27 under Steve Lovell, so that's 0.37 per game. Slightly under what he was under AD, but he scores his goals over a more consistent basis. And effectively, as a partnership, 27 games together, I've worked out, I think it is, this might not be 100% correct, I've done it to the best I can, and they've scored 19 goals at 0.7 per game. 19 in 27, cannot be sniffed at at any level. If you was getting Sky Sports looking at that in the Premier League, they'd be waxing lyrical about it. So it's another thing that Steve Lovell's improved, kept us solid defensively, but a lot more potent going forward, creating chances, scoring goals, which obviously leads you to winning more football matches, which is great to see. Um, generally, it's just been really good and it's been fun to watch, hasn't it? I mean, unfortunately, due to circumstances, um, I've not been able to go to away games this season as of yet. I've only done Maidstone away in the Kent Trophy. Uh, we'll be heading to Fratton Park next Saturday. Fingers crossed that all this weather's cleared up. It should have done. Um, but yeah, for those fans travelling on the road with us since Steve Lovell's come in, it's been absolutely superb, um, very jealous. Uh, the home form hasn't been quite as good, but it has improved again compared to what it was under Adrian Pennock and Steve Lovell. So we're still going in the right direction. Um, yes, we've had a minor blip in the last few weeks um, in terms of it's only been one win in six, but that's going to happen. You're going to have peaks and troughs of form. All teams will have it. And um, as I said on the Monday review, we've got four games coming up, potentially they look pretty tough. We um, Three, sorry, Rotherham's not on, is it? Uh, so next Saturday, Fratton Park for Portsmouth away. Then we host Blackburn right up there challenging. And then we go to Bradford, who are still a good side despite their recent troubles, uh, before hosting MK Dons, I think, last game of the month. So if we can get to that 50-point mark, I think, before the end of March, then that's excellent. Then we've got a free month in terms of April and see how far it takes us. Um, but we've been really good under Steve Lovell. Um, he generally hasn't got anything wrong. He's come out and admitted that the first 45 minutes last Saturday at Berry weren't good enough. Um, but it happens. As he said, he lives and dies by the sword. He makes the decisions. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. That's football. But it's great to see that he's willing to change things. I think for, for far too long under Justin towards the back end of his reign, 
and Adrian Pennant, we was just praying and shouting and screaming at the dugout from the stands to make a change, to change the system, because it seemed clear to four or 5,000 fans that it weren't working, but to the people that it seemed to, that needed to make the decision, they couldn't see it. So great to see, won't always come off, but um, as I've said plenty of times, if we'd been offered this, um, the jump from 23rd to 11th in the league table under Steve Lover, we'd have all taken it um, right at the beginning of his reign. Um, right, something a little bit different now. Going to have a look at a few varying games this season. And the first one coming up on your screen right now is our best home display in my opinion. That is my choice for best home performance of the season and that was the one-all draw under Steve Lovell back in October on the back of um, his first two games, I think it was, where we'd beaten Peterborough and then lost to Northampton. We reacted really well on the Tuesday night. Uh, Wigan, best team in the league for me. Um, them or Blackburn, I would say. Um, but yeah, we were really, really good that night. We outplayed them for, for large portions of that game and Paul Cook, their gaffer, admitted and said they'd got away with one by getting a draw. I know we started slightly slowly, first 15 minutes, but after that we really grew into the game. I remember Billy Bingham was outrageously good that game um, and sadly he picked up an injury shortly after. Um, but Tom Eve scored a, a big header in the second half in front of the Reina men. Love them there, don't you, Tom? And... Um, it took a weldy, to be fair, from Sam Morsey, 25 yards out, pinged one in the top corner um, in the latter stages of the game. And that's that's the kind of calibre of goal that it took to pick, peg us back that night. But it was a really good point against a really good side. Um, I was torn between that and the win over Bristol Rovers just before Christmas, the 4-1 win, the Mark Byrne volley. But for me, in terms of how good Wigan are, no disrespect to Bristol Rovers, I'm going to plump for Gillingham 1, Wigan 1 as our best home performance of the season so far. In terms of a best away display, you've just seen it come up on the screen. I have plumped for our 3-1 win in October up at uh, Rotherham United. Um, scored early on in that game, went 2-0 up um, and then finished them off late on. Josh Parker double and a Tom Eves diving yeah. header. Um, we were really, really good that day. All the reports suggested we outplayed them for pretty much the whole game. We started bright, we pressed. Uh, we were solid enough defensively, scored three really good goals. Um, and to put it into context, they'd won six on the bounce uh, at home prior to, prior to us arriving. So they were in absolutely superb form on their own patch. And we turned them over and we turned them over pretty comfortably. Um, and I think that was another result early on in the rain where we thought, hang about, Steve Lovell could potentially do a decent job on a longer term basis for us. Um, Honourable mention goes to Charlton away, New Year's Day. Went up there and won for the first time in our history 2-1. Another, another game where we started really well, went 2-0 in front and then dug in second half. Um, but for me, in terms of the comparative forms of the two sides, I'm going to plump for Rotherham 3-1 away win back in October as our best away performance so far. And coming up now, I'm doing best individual display by a Gillingham player and it is this man coming up on your screen. Big man, Tom Eaves, came in in the summer uh, to not much fanfare. He'd only scored four goals for Yeovil last season in League Two. So plenty of fans, rightfully so, were questioning whether he could jump up and make the step up to League One. We've since, but, uh, since spoken to him on the channel and he was very bullish about how good he thinks he can be and that he, he set himself a target. If you remember, Jules fans of 20 back in the summer. And again, plenty of... Um, raised eyebrows by Gillingham football um, fans. He's got 14 so far. But for me, best individual display, uh, especially considering in the first half he was um, pretty far from his best, to be quite honest. And I'm sure Tom's big enough and ugly enough to admit that himself. But second half, shooting towards the rain amend against South End back in August. Not only did he score our first goal of the season, he went on and got a hat-trick and he was pretty much unplayable from the time he scored his first goal. Absolutely superb frontman performance. Held it up, bullied centre-halves, ran the channels, scored three goals. What more can you want? Centre forward to judge on goals. He got three of them, earned us a point and got us up and running for the season, or at least we hoped at the time. But so, for me, I am plumping for Tom Eaves and I'm going to do an honourable mention for another Tom and that is Thomas Holy in the home win slightly uh, a little while after that draw um, 
where he made save after save after save and kept a clean sheet in a 1-0 win at home to Charlton. He had to contend with flares being chucked at him and all sorts of nonsense. But for me, unfortunately, attackers get all the praise. So sorry, Thomas, but I am sticking with Thomas Eves for his hat-trick against Southend as our best individu in individual performance of the season so far. Um, now for the not-so-good side of things. Coming up on your screen now, Jules fans, is worst home performance to date. Uh, Gillingham Football Club and our and its fans, us, um, we tend to have a, a bit of a love-hate relationship with Sky Sports. Sky Sports love putting us on their channel from time to time. We hate it because, quite frankly, we are rubbish on the box, um, historically. Um, if you remember BT Sport a couple of seasons ago under Justin Edinburgh, FA Cup replay, we got turned over live on the telly and home to Portsmouth back in October, it got no better. Uh, well, it did in the fact that we didn't concede four to a non-league side. We only conceded one to a half-decent Portsmouth side, but to be quite frank, it was absolutely shocking. It was an abomination of a performance. We didn't have a shot on target creatively. Creative, but it was at an absolute minimal. Um, I remember Boz and Stocky were lucky enough they was away for the weekend. Um, they didn't get to go, so that was probably the only saving grace for them. I think they watched it on a pub, so at least they had um, access to alcohol for the whole game. Um, I took my old man, and I don't think he's been back since, bless him. Um, it was shocking, absolutely shocking. I'm not going to say too more about it, too much more about it, um, other than the fact that the turnaround again under Steve Lovell put a positive spin on it. Uh, Portsmouth fans were singing "You're Going Down" live at us on Sky Sports, and to be quite frank, I agreed with them back then. We were gone. Um, we were absolutely awful. We, um, as Jules fans, couldn't really see a light at the end of the tunnel. Um, but now, with Portsmouth away on the horizon in seven or eight days' time. Uh, we go up there pretty much next to him in the league. So that shows you how good um, we've been since Steve Lovell took over. So that's my positive spin and my silver lining. Um, I'm not going to do an honourable mention because I don't want to think of another shocking home, perform uh, home performance. Um, but I will go on now to this one coming up on your telly and that is Worst Away this time. Those of you that have been subscribing to the channel for the for the duration of this season or longer, will remember that after this game, I went into full ramp mode back in September and demanded that Adrian Pennant leave the football club immediately. I was sick to the back teeth of watching us. I was sick to the back teeth of doing Monday reviews um, and having to talk about horrible performances, us just rolling over and having our belly tickled like a, like a lazy puppy, us just rolling over and dying, giving up in games, surrendering and Oxford was the one that broke the camel's back for me. Um, and after what was, judging by all the reports, a pretty decent first half shown from us at the Kassam, we were nil-nil at the break. By the 54th minute, we were out of sight and I was done with um, Adrian Pennock. We conceded three and eight minutes and it was an absolutely shocking spell. Um, I remember people at the game saying that they'd never seen anything like it. It was absolute carnage. And all the good work that we'd done for 45 minutes was undone in pretty much an instant. And I think it was then that I realised that, that Adrian Pennock could not continue at our football club uh, unless we wanted to be a League 2 football side. Um, thankfully, it didn't last too much longer. I think it was another 3-0 reverse a couple of weeks after that at Rochdale when he finally bit the bullet. But yeah, in terms of away displays, that was absolutely awful. If you want to check out my rant, it is quite amusing now looking back at it, but at the time it wasn't funny and it did go quite viral in terms of how many views we get as a channel. But um, Thankfully, there's not been too many of them recently and it's been a lot more positive. But yeah, that's my worst away display of the season. Oxford United 3, Gillingham 0. Um, but now um, to individual players. Again, I'm going with this man on the screen as um, best summer signing. He's already been mentioned. You can probably tell who it's going to be. Yep. It is our big Scouse frontman, Thomas Eves, who has 14 goals in 37 appearances for us this season. Record speaks for itself, don't have to say too much more. As I've already mentioned, when he arrived in the summer, four goals in 40-odd games for Yeovil and a division below. Plenty doubted him. He's been superb on the whole. Absolutely brilliant. You can probably count the number of bad games he's had on. It's not many. Um, 
and of them 14 goals, he has scored in 11 different games. And in them 11 different games, we've won seven, drawn three and lost only once, which was at Plymouth when he had a goal incorrectly chalked out, even though it crossed the line at 0-0. And even in defeat, he managed to score a goal of the season contender with that dipping volley from 25 yards. Um, in terms of honourable mentions, I'm going to say Luke O'Neill, uh, Gabby Zaquani and Sean Clare. Um, all three of them have been really good. Obviously, Sean Clare went back to Sheffield Wednesday after his loan expired at the turn of the year. And he's now doing bits in the championship for his parent club, Sheffield Wednesday. So good luck to you, Sean. Scored your first goal for them last week. Read reports that Premier League sides are already looking at you. I'm not sure how true that was, but keep working hard. Let's see how far he can go. He's probably um, not going to come back to us now. It's one of them things. But thank you for them first few months of the season, Sean. It was a pleasure watching you. And also to Luke O'Neill and Gabby Zaquani who have shored up what was an absolutely shocking defence from last season. So big credit to them too as well. Um, but now, unfortunately, on to the flip side of that. And that is, in my opinion, this man coming up as our worst summer side. No, it sounds harsh. Um, but looking at the fanfare that he arrived to, Alex Lacey pictured... He's only played 13 times, unfortunately. I'm not saying he's a bad player. When I've seen him, he's been decent enough, but we've just not seen enough of him. Um, he's been injured most time, uh, most of the season. He picked up a knock in pre-season, started late, had to play catch-up, and then each time he's come back, he's picked up more niggles. Um, he's been out for the last few weeks, and he's still a couple of weeks away, apparently. So let's hope we can get him fit for the last month of the season. Um, but just looking at the statistics, I'm not just chucking the name out for the sake of it. He's only played 13 times, granted most of them were under the Adrian Penner and Peter Taylor regime when we were horrible as a whole, um, but we've only won three times with him in the side. Uh, the last one being Bristol Rovers away at home, sorry, Bristol Rovers at home and Fleetwood at home. Um, that was when he got injured for the, the most recent occasion was Fleetwood when he come on and done something to his ankle, which is a recurrence of the problem he had earlier on in the campaign. So yeah, by no means a bad player. Jules fans, don't don't jump on me and start abusing me for that. It's just unfortunately that with the level of pedigree that he seemed to come with, it's just been very disappointing that we've not seen enough of him. And compared to what other people have done, um, he's probably the one that's, that's had the least effect on the positives that we have done this season, along with maybe one more, which is Liam Nash, but it's a slightly different situation because he's only a kid and he come from a very lowly non-league. So, um, yeah, Alex Lacey gets my vote for um, worst summer signing, unfortunately. Sorry, Alex. Um, I'm sure that once you get fully fit, you'll prove to be an excellent acquisition um, and we'll compete with the other three very good centre-halves that we have at the football club. Um, right, that is everything now in terms of the season so far, but we do have a lot of players out of contract so I am now going to have a look at all of them right I'm going to run through this individually uh, in alphabetical order of all the Gillingham Football Club players that are out of contract this summer and whether I would give them a one year deal a two year deal or release um, I'm not going any higher than two year deals because we don't tend to give them out um, it's very rare that we go three year contracts so that's how it's going to work and I will crack straight on with Mark Byrne our Irish centre midfielder who came from Newport a couple of summers ago he's been really really good this season I think if you took out the early season form of the likes of Thomas Holy and uh, Tom Eaves he'd be a massive contender for player of the season um, he started adding goals to his game which is really good uh, no one will forget that howitzer against Bristol Rovers and more recently uh, the curler late on against Shrewsbury a week ago last Tuesday to earn us a point um, and I would give Mark Byrne a two year contract um, I think he's a very important cog in our central midfield now and deserves a two year deal uh, Ben Chapman uh, first year pro I would just give him another year we've not seen enough of him but a lot of talk from within the club Mark Patterson etc that he's a really good prospect so I would renew that for another 12 months uh, next up is Greg Cundall and uh, might be slightly controversial amongst some Jules fans because he's still only young but for me he's been around the first team for a few years now I'm still not sure where he plays I've, I've heard talk of that he finishes like Harry Kane in training but I've not seen it in games he's gone out on loan to Kingstonian um, for me I'd release him I've, I've said it I, 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 don't under, I don't see what he offers I don't think he offers enough as either a centre forward or a number 10 
um, or a playmaker or whatever we want to call him. So for me, I would let Greg Kundal go. Um, next up is Max Amar, our German centre-half, ridiculed by plenty. Not sure why. He's been first class all season. Similar to Mark Byrne, be a contender for player of the year for me. And I would give Max Amar a two-year contract. We've finally got some solidity and continuity at the back, and he's been a massive part of that. So for that reason, I'd give him a two-year deal. Bradley Garmston, probably one of the best left-backs in the division if you can get him fit. But unfortunately, for the best part of two years, he hasn't been fit. Keeps picking up niggles. Um, if he can prove his fitness between now and the end of the campaign, I would give him 12 months and then maybe look at it halfway through next season, uh, extending it. Um, so yeah, fitness permitting, I'd give Bradley Garmston another year. Um, but unfortunately, if he breaks down again and starts suffering more injury problems between now and the end of April, then it might be a case that we have to cut our losses. Um, next up is Thomas Hadler, highly rated young goalkeeper, has now been promoted to number two after the recent departures of Stuart Nelson and Steve Arnold. Two-year deal for me. Um, he's a little bit further along than the likes of um, Ben Chapman um, and other ones that were mentioned, Aaron Simpson, that type, but we'll get to them in a minute. So for me, I'd give him a two-year deal, say, right, you're number two now. Go and compete with Thomas Holy to be number one. Um, Let's give him a chance. You, how, people say he's got no experience. Well, you need to play to get experience. So let's give him a chance. And for me, if we're not getting in the playoffs and we're not going to get relegated last few games of the season, I'll be inclined to play Thomas Hadder in the last two or three League One games to give him some proper big match experience. And then it sets him up nicely for the summer and next season. Um, next up is Elliot List. Another one I'm not sure about. Steve Lovell seems to rate him. I think when he's really good, he's really good. But when he's not so much, he's pretty average. I think he just needs to believe in his own ability a bit more. He's got place to burn. Um, when he's very good, he gets to the byline and, and puts in dangerous deliveries, but he doesn't do it enough. But I'd still be inclined to give him another year. Maybe I'm making that decision based on the fact that I know Steve Lovell rates him. But I'd give Elliot List another 12 months. But again, I said this back in the summer, it's a big season coming up for Elliot List. He needs to start breaking through on a more regular basis. Uh, next up is Lee Martin, the skipper. Uh, for me, two-year deal. He's come back brilliantly from that horrific injury that he picked up shortly after joining. Um, he's proved himself as a captain, despite plenty saying he shouldn't even be in the side. I'll be honest, beginning of the campaign, I wasn't sure what he was offering. But under Steve Lovell, like plenty of others, he's flourished. Uh, he's started to pitch in with a few goals. Um, had a bit of a niggle recently, which is a shame because he'd been he'd been pretty decent before then. Um, but for me, I'd give Lee Martin a two-year contract, keep him as captain, uh, and just you know, it gives gives everyone you know, belief in what we're doing, that we're, we're trying to keep our best players, that type of thing, and keeping the captain consistent. That's what we need. Um, so that's my reasons behind a two-year deal. Nolan Bow, another one, looks to be an out-and-out -out scorer, but at a lower level, youth football for us. I'd give him another 12 months and see how he progresses again. Aaron Morris. Um, as much as it breaks me heart to say it, because I spoke to Aaron back in May, he's a really lovely lad. Um, he's a very good footballer as well on top of that but unfortunately he's had two massive knee injuries we've not seen him all season we didn't see him all last season he's out of contract I can only see it ending one way I would have to release Aaron Morris on the fact that you can't trust his knee anymore unfortunately um, and the fact that we've got Billy Bingham coming back I know he's coming back from a, a leg break himself so we're hoping he's not going down the same route but we've got Billy Bingham we've got Mark Byrne we've got Jake Hessenthaler we've got Darren Aldaker there's plenty of other central midfielders that are not as injury prone as Aaron, unfortunately. And as hard as it is to say, I think we've seen the last of Aaron Morris in a Gillingham football shirt. Frank Moose up next, another interesting one for me. Signed in January on a short-term deal till the end of the season, having been released by Walsall last summer. I'd give him a year. Um, people might say, well, he's, hard. he's not played for us since he, since he arrived. He's only got 20 minutes at Wigan, I think it was. Yes, he has. But we know that fully fit, and with the benefit maybe of a full pre-season with us, I think he's a very good League One footballer. He's had really good spells at Coventry. He's, he's been around the block. He's still only 28. He'd offer us something different. He's left-footed. It would give us balance. So for me, I'd give him 12 months, regardless of how much he plays between now and the end of the campaign. Yeah, a year deal for me. Uh, next on the list is Rhys Murphy, another one who joined in the January transfer window, front man formerly of uh, Forest Green, Dagenham. For me, it's a release at the moment, unfortunately. It looks like he's been one that's just, he's coming to bolster numbers, signed. We haven't seen him even in the squad yet in a month, so um, we're now in March. So for me, unless he suddenly has an excellent two months and gets in the side and starts banging in the goals, which I can't see happening, unfortunately, due to the form of others, 
Then for me, Reese Murphy, I'd say thanks, but no thanks, and move him on in the summer. And it would be the same for the next one on the list, Navid Nasseri, joined at the same time. Again, we've not seen him. He's been on the bench once or twice, I think. Um, but unless he has an excellent end to the season, then it's another one that I'd, I'd let go at the end of the season. Um, on to Ben Nugent next, our big left-footed centre-half. I would give him another year. He's still only 24. He's a big lump. He's a proper old-school throwback centre-half. He heads it, he tackles, he wins, and he gets rid. Um, people have compared him to Gary Richards more recently. I think going back a bit further, maybe a Guy Butters type on the left-hand side of a back three, he can do a job. He's never going to be you know, doing drag backs and step overs and playing through balls to people, but that's not his job. So um, I've liked what I've seen of him. He's not played enough, again, but that's more due to the form of Gabriel Zaquani and Max Hamer. But for me, I think Ben Nugent's worth another year. Um, we've got a very decent set of centre-backs at the club now, and I don't see any reason to change it too much unless someone who's very, very good becomes available. Um, Darren Aldacre, another one, is slightly in front of the likes of Ben Chapman and... Uh, Aaron Simpson, like I've already said, he's another one. He's been in around the first team squad since Justin was at the club and it's very highly rated. But for me, there's something that seems slightly wrong in terms of an attitude at the moment. He's currently out on loan at Hive and doing very well, which is good to see. He's getting games. Steve Lovell did mention in this week's Medway Messenger that he's not going to move him from there because he's enjoying his football. They could try and move him up the level, up a level. But but why? When he, he might go there and somewhere else and just sit on the bench. So they're going to leave him at Hive. They've got no objections to him staying there for the end, uh, till the end of the season. He's getting games, he's getting goals, he's getting confidence, which is great to see. So for me, another year for Darren Oldacre, but I think next season he really needs to push on. Finn O'Mara, similar boat, he's been very good. Spoke to him back in May, great kid, got his head screwed on right. Uh, can play right back, centre half. Um, got rave reviews at Folkestone earlier on in the campaign and he's back with us now. So I'd give him another 12 months and, and let him try and push, into, push on and push into the first team next season. Aaron Simpson, exactly the same, copy and paste. He's out on loan at um, Margate at the moment. We went and watched him a few weeks ago um, for them against Lowestoft Town, and he'd done all right at left back. I know last week he extended his loan till the end of the season, and he played um, left midfield and left back last week and set up a goal in their 3 2 defeat. Um, so, yeah, leave him there. He's going to get more minutes, which is great. Give him another 12 months, assess in the summer, and let's see if he can push on and compete next season. You never know, he could be number, number two left back because. Um, well, depends. obviously depends on other contracts, but say we get Bradley Garmston, we could have Aaron Simpson as the backup if Conor Ogilvy's going back to Tottenham. But we'll get to um, Conor in a minute. Bradley Stevenson. Similar to Greg Cundall for me, this might be controversial again. I don't know where he plays. Is he a set Some people who watch the youth team more often probably know more than me, but I've seen him in friendlies and I've seen him in checker trade games and, and, and trophy, Ken Trophy games. I don't, I'm not sure where he plays. Is he a winger? Is he a centre midfielder? I don't know. Um... We've got plenty in them positions. We've got the likes of, if he's a winger, we've got the likes of Elliot List and Scott Wagstaff and, and Josh Parker can play from the side. Lee Martin can play from the side. Um, if he's a centre midfielder, he's, he's way down the pecking order in terms of Mark Byrne, Jay Kessenthaler, like Billy Bingham, um, Darren Aldake, you can probably put in that list as well. Um, so for me, I would say release. He's been out on loan a couple of times this season. He's nowhere near getting in the first team squad. So for me, I'd let go at the end of the season just to free up a wage. It won't be loads, but get rid of two, maybe bring in one of, of, a, of a, a better ability. So, um, Sorry, Bradley, that's just my opinion. It's nothing personal. Next one, Scott Wagstaff, similarly to Bradley Garmston. Um, he needs to prove his fitness. He's had two years with us and he's just picked up niggle after niggle after niggle. Just when you think he's coming back and getting back to form, he then breaks down again and we have to lose him for a month, which is really frustrating. The biggest one was this season, just before Christmas. Really, really good. Was really starting to get a good run of games and then and then done a hamstring again and we lost him for a period of time. So again, it would be in a similar situation to Bradley Garmston. If he proves his fitness between now and the end of the season, give him a year and then maybe reassess at Christmas and, and extend it. Uh, and the final one in terms of uh, players on permanent contracts is Gabriel Zaquani. Um, we signed him on a 12-month deal last summer. He's been really, really good. Proper defender again in the sort of Ben Nugent moulding that he heads it, tackles, wins it. Um, slightly more experience, which is good. You need that. We need a good blend in the squad. For that reason, I'll give him two years. He's only 31 still. Um, if he keeps himself fit, I'm sure he's got another two or three years in him. So I would give Gabriel Zaquani a two-year contract. Um, I'd probably make him club captain. Um, leave Lee Martin to be skipper on the pitch. 
but again it comes back to Max Amar as well and just in general we need continuity we need consistency we've built up a decent base under Steve Lovell of where we want to be where we want to get to and we need to build on that next campaign so let's let's get the building blocks that have been set let's get them in place and cemented in so to speak and Gabriel Zaquani for me is one of them so I'd give him a two year deal and in terms of those people on loan with us we've got Connor Ogilvy and Callum Riley on loan from Tottenham and Berry, respectively for me They've both been alright. Connor Ogilvy for me, I didn't think started too great at the beginning of the season, but he's improved as the campaign's gone on. Um, it might be a case that we get him back on loan again. I know his contract with Tottenham runs out next year, so summer 2019, so it's not that we can look at him and get him in now. Um, Callum Riley, there was talk of him maybe being viewed to buy it in the summer, but it depends how much Mr Chairman releases for the gaffer to spend. So, yeah, I'd keep an eye on both. They might, they're, they're decent enough options to come back in if need be, but if there's better out there or if we can get players in on a permanent, then I'd maybe be more inclined to go that way. But, yeah, they're definitely different, not decent options to have available. Um, right, that is about it from me today. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed it. It's been slightly different, slightly longer than usual. Please keep doing as you do. There is a box just underneath this video in the link where you can comment on YouTube about my, your thoughts on who we should release, who we should keep, what length of contract, how good a job Steve Lovell's doing, um, how bad Adrian Pennant was. We'll probably all agree on that. Um, if there's something else we can get out over the weekend or Monday to fill a gap, because there's no Monday review, obviously, due to the, the lack of fixture, then we'll try and do that. If not, you'll have to wait till next Thursday to hear my dulcet tones again. Um, thanks for the ongoing support. YouTube is over 700 now, so thank you very much. Whisper it quietly. I don't want people to unsubscribe. Um, <laughs> yep, yeah. so cheers for that. Thanks, for, as always, for watching. And until next time, up the jewels. <laughs>